grace and peace to you in the name of Christ. Let us worship God. It is good to be worshiping here with you. This is obviously yet another new format. Today, we're trying to include the entire worship team or as many as we possibly can. It's a new format for us, hopefully one that's better for you, but we ask your forgiveness as we stumble along as we do in so many areas of our lives right now. I'll be toggling back and forth between images of us and images of the worship bulletin. So hopefully that will come in time for you to follow along. But what matters most today is the spirit that we bring to this gathering. Whether or not you can see all the words or find the right screens, what matters the most is the spirit we bring and the spirit that we recognize surrounds us and is within us. So with that, let us begin as we so often do by taking three deep breaths wherever we are. Expanding our awareness that we might recognize the Holy Spirit in our midst. And now let us continue with the introit. This is a simple two phrase introit. The two phrases are identical in text, but the music is slightly different. So I will sing it through once and I invite you to sing it with me two more times. Blessed is the one who comes in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who 
comes in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one comes in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name, who comes in the name of the Lord. And now I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are those who come to walk, to walk in, his in his way. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. Hosanna praise. praise from the highest and lowest places. And now let's join together in our opening hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. I do want to welcome you again to worship on this Palm Sunday, that we are not together waving actual palms. My family had some fun coloring some palms. This one's mine. And then this one is my son's. I don't know if you can tell, but it is a tie-dye palm. <laughs> Nothing like being a little creative here as we shelter at home. So a blessed Palm Sunday to each one of you. Let's join together now in our community prayer. Let us pray together. Loving God, faithful God, calling God. In Christ, we are surprised yet again at your desire. Rather than triumph in the form of power, we are met with triumph in the power of weakness. 
rather than triumph executed through violence, we see triumph even over execution itself. Forgive us for wanting a conquering spirit and plant in us the seeds of servanthood and empowerment of the weak. Deliver us from the fear of death that we might be emboldened to do good no matter the cost. Amen. Our prayers continue in quiet. Amen. Laying aside judgment, God offers us redemption. Setting aside anger, God embraces us with love. Friends, this is the good news that God's steadfast love endures forever. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. And now Jeff is going to share a time of discovery with us. The last time, good morning, everybody. The last time that I was with you for this, uh, I had talked about how you are my heroes. And one of the reasons that you're my heroes right now is you have still, most of you still have your schoolwork. You still have your homework, you're still doing all that, but you don't get to play as much as you used to and you don't get to have fun with your friends. That's rough, that makes you heroes. So I actually brought my friends along again. Uh, they're right here to be, to stand in for you. There we go. So for time of discovery today, uh, I brought all my heroes here because that's who you are. And I think it's interesting that these are all action figure superheroes. I got Iron Man over here, and he can fly through the sky, and he has those cool things on his hands where you go like that. And then I got, uh, let's see, I got Spider-Man. Spider-Man, you know, he climbs around, and he swings around to catch the bad guys. And I got Captain America over here, and Captain America has his shield, and Thor, and Black Widow, and all these people, they're action figures. You know what they do? They go get the bad guys. And that's a different world maybe than the one Jesus lived in. So this, we're coming to the most important week, I think, in the whole calendar for us as Christians. And that is the Easter week. And it starts today with Palm Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday because people would lay palms on the path that Jesus came into Jerusalem. But when Jesus came into Jerusalem, do you think he came in like Iron Man? Do you think he came in soaring through the sky? Do you think he came in like Spider Man? Do you think he came in? swinging in like a live action superhero? Do you think he came in like Black Panther climbing over, climbing up walls and things? I mean, maybe he could have done that, but he didn't do any of that. He came riding on something very special. I'll give you some hints. It wasn't a Jeep, it wasn't a tank, it wasn't a car. But he came riding on something very special. And if you want to know what he came riding in, and maybe even think about why he came riding in the way he did, we want to invite you to go find our time of discovery on Facebook and YouTube. And maybe share that with your parents and tell them how Jesus came in to save the day in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Now, let me ask. Uh, I can't dismiss you to your class right now, <laughs> but I will bring you back over here to my corner <laughs> and we're going to share in some joys and concerns. You know, I'm, 
I'm not with you, but I see you. Uh, I see your posts, I see your videos, I see your stories. Um, and we are not with each other, but we see each other. And certainly today, while we can't, uh, we don't feel the hugs and the high fives and the handshakes. We certainly share a lot of feelings right now, I think. We share feelings of angst over and worry about future. We share joys, maybe that you've finally been forced to pause and recognize the beauty around you, or you have joys of all other things, being inspired by what other people are doing, and babies are still being born. There are so many things to celebrate. So we want to share our joys and concerns with each other. What we would invite you to do, we would love for you to do, is write your joys and concerns in the comment box of these videos, whether you're watching via Facebook or YouTube. And we, <laughs> While this is live for us and not to you, we will be watching those comments live and we will certainly as a staff continue to pray over them. And it is a great, uh, I don't know about you, I, I know many of you know this, I don't have the best memory, <laughs> but what a, what a great resource it is to just have all those prayers written down for each other. Um, so we will continue to pray for each other. Uh, and as we pray for each other, may we pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that our Lord taught us so many years ago. Our Lord thy God, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Ruthie. And now we hear our first scripture lesson for today. 
which is from Psalm 118. We'll give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and God has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. For God's steadfast love endures forever. This is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. And the gospel lesson comes from the book of Matthew, the 21st chapter, verses 1 to 11. Continue to listen for what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that were followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Friends, this too is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. I have to say it's a little unsettling to be seeing a big picture of me staring back at me. I would say, though, I guess these times have, uh, have required a lot of us to look at ourselves in the mirror. We've probably seen sides of us we may not have enjoyed. I know you're not used to seeing me like this either. It's not how we typically interface. No robe, no collar. But these things aren't essentials, of course. They're just tools. I wear those things because they help remind me what we're doing when we worship, and maybe in doing so remind you as well. I didn't have a chance to grab my robe and it would look a little silly in my living room had I done so. But when I sensed this was coming, I did pick up one of these, thinking it might come in handy if we had to worship this way. I'll try to hold it so you can see it. This is uh, probably my favorite stole. I get compliments on it whenever um, I wear it. It's got these wonderfully hand-sewn three-dimensional scenes on it. And so I enjoy pulling it out every Lent. 
from time to time, people ask me about the symbolism of a stole. And there are a lot of elements to it, a lot of layers. Some uh, say, for example, that it uh, bears a striking resemblance to what the priests wore or is meant to imitate what the ancient priests wore in Older Testament times. And it's interesting, if you read in the scriptures about what the priests wore, that bears a striking resemblance to how the tabernacle was decorated. The tabernacle, as you know, I trust, or maybe if you haven't heard, uh, was sort of a movable tent for God before the temple was built. They believe God really dwelled there. And what an image that is, then, that the priest was adorned like the tabernacle. And in doing so, then the priest becomes a movable tent for the dwelling of God. Now, in our tradition, in the Reformed tradition, we don't think that's simply the role of the priest. In fact, we don't even have priests. Oh, I said that wrong. Actually, all we have are priests. In the Reformed tradition, we speak about the priesthood of all believers. Now think about that for a moment. That means all of us, each of us, whether we're wearing one of these things or not, is in fact a movable dwelling place for the living God. That we carry this around with us. Isn't that an amazing image to hold? Kenda Creasy Dean is a professor at Princeton Seminary, youth ministry and other fields. She uses a slightly different way of speaking about this to communicate this same great truth. She talks about us being God bearers in her book, The God Bearing Life, that we all carry around God within us and therefore we all have the potential to birth God in some form into the world. The term God-bearer was originally used solely to refer to Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Greek was Theotokos, God-bearer. But what Creasy Dean recognizes, just like the mystics who came before her, is that each of us, not just Mary, bears God within us, even bears Christ within us. That's an image. What if I told you then that we all woke up today pregnant? And that's no joke about sheltering in place either. Would you laugh if I told you that? Like Sarah laughed when God told her she was with child? How would you respond to that possibility? Oh, don't get lost in literalism. And remember what happened when Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus said, well, you must be born again or born from above or born again from above. Nicodemus couldn't figure it out. He couldn't figure out how to, how to return to the womb. He couldn't get his head around it because his head was stuck in literalism. But this belongs to the realm of the poetic and you don't get your head around a poem. You let the poem get around your heart. And so it is with the gospel truth. Well, whether or not you truly feel as though you are bearing God right now, I know that you're carrying something. All of us are carrying something, particularly in these times. And I'll resist the temptation to list what those things might be for fear of either leaving yours out and making you feel as though what you're carrying isn't significant enough, be it sorrow or joy, challenge or success or somehow projecting onto you what you should be experiencing or feeling in these times. Only you know that. But might I suggest to you that whatever you're carrying, you have the capacity within you to translate that thing into a godly gift to the world. What do I mean by that? Say you're carrying right around, right now, you're carrying around a lot of joy, um, excuse me, a lot of sadness, a lot of mourning or grief. 
that grief, that sadness can be a bridge to you, to compassion. Your pain helps you connect to the pain of others. By experiencing your own sadness and connecting to others and theirs, you are giving birth to godly compassion in the world, to Christ-like love. Maybe instead you're experiencing frustration, even anger at some of what you're seeing going on in the world. Well, that anger and that frustration, if properly channeled, can become a bridge to a more just world because it might motivate you and motivate others to look at how things are and to make changes where changes need to be made. And in doing so, you're bearing God, you're bearing Christ-like witness to the world. Or maybe you are feeling joy. Maybe you're feeling an energy in the midst of this. Some, some goodness has come to you. Well, that becomes a bridge to hope. And in giving other people hope in these moments, you are bearing God to the world. You are bearing Christ-like presence into the world. So even as we hunker down, even in these shadows, we recognize that every shadow has the capacity to point to a greater light. Even as we shelter in place in the face of an approaching or encroaching disease or even for some death. Well, today, as you know, we celebrate Palm Sunday when Jesus encroached upon or approached the holy city. And the imagery around these stories comes from the Older and the Newer Testaments about how royalty was to be received. The waving and the singing and the laying of cloaks and the branches, all of it is a royal procession. But obviously, we're not able to gather as we typically do to celebrate this procession, waving our own palms and singing and shouting Hosanna. But you know, that plays right into a debate that happens around this story, because we're not truly sure how many people were there. We're told it was a great procession, but it could be great in a couple of senses, quite different from one another. It could be great in the obvious sense that there were scores of people there, an overwhelming crowd recognizing Jesus for who he was and is. Or perhaps it was not great in number, but great in irony. Great in how profound it was in its satire of the other procession happening on the other side of town around Pontius Pilate. One procession about uh, military power and force, the ability to, to coerce people into a certain way of behavior through threat of even death, of excess, of obvious and overwhelming strength. And the other procession about strength and weakness and vulnerability in servant leadership, in sacrificial, sacrificial love, in restorative justice rather than vengeful justice, in reconciliation rather than dividing and conquering. Great might have been Christ's procession in the way it held up a mirror to the other procession. Now, it's easy for us year after year to show up and wave our palms and celebrate Christ's procession into Jerusalem because we know how the story ended and how it continues. I still have some of my fondest memories here of our first Palm Sunday. If I have this right, it would have been our first and our son would have been less than two at the time. And I'll never forget when the children went around the sanctuary waving their palms and singing. I couldn't see him coming down the center aisle till some of the kids parted and then there he was, but he wasn't walking alone. He was being led by the hand by Bethany's son, Ben. Just a toddler led by an older child. And so it has been for generation after generation, the slightly older leading the slightly younger in this act of celebration of what the true Messiah is and how he is and how he acts and what his love looks like. And have we not witnessed some of that sacrificial love in this time as well? Maybe Christ being birthed, God being birthed into the world, even in the midst of this frightening pandemic. 
I mean, you can name the stories as well as can I of the Italian priest Don Giuseppe Berardelli, who at 72 was put on a ventilator purchased for him by his parish. And yet he was uh, conscious enough to notice that there was a younger patient who needed one, so he asked to be removed that the ventilator might be given to this younger patient. The priest died so that the younger patient might live. And maybe you've seen those images, that video of the Italian Air Force. Have you seen this? They were blasting Pavarotti, the, 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 the song Nessun Dorma, Let No One Sleep. And the, the planes were flying in, in formation in one direction, and then there was a single plane coming at it from another direction. These planes were to represent the nation. This was the single plane representing the virus. And right when they converged, and as the music uh, echoed out the, the pivotal line, we will overcome the formation breaks toward the heavens and out of the exhaust come the colors of the Italian flag. We've seen countless works of gorgeous art, musical witness, resistance, you might say, to not only the virus, but the despair that comes with it. And we might say, oh, couldn't those resources have been otherwise spent? Well, let us not make false dichotomies. Let us recognize the importance of lifting the human spirit, for if we don't save the human spirit, what is there left to save? It's been moving for me, and I'm sure for you, to watch sisters and brothers saving others. I have a friend who's a pastor at a small church in Atlanta. And the women in the church, there was a women's ministry in the church, and they saw that there was an open room in the facility that had been abandoned and not, wasn't being used much anymore. And they asked if they could have it because they had it in them to start a ministry for refugees. They wanted to teach refugees how to sew that they could have a marketable and a useful skill. And so they commandeered the room and they rehabbed it and they started holding sewing classes for refugees. And the pastor told a story about his mother-in-law going through that transition where you downsize from a full-size home into uh, a retirement community. Well, it just so happened that she had been a master seamstress of sorts. So she donated all this wonderful fabric to the ministry just about the time that the virus came. And so now those refugee women are sewing masks that we might be safe in our land, which is now their land. And maybe you saw, such as I did, the videos of police in other countries trying to maintain the quarantine, but do it with some semblance of joy too. And so in Spain, the police drive down the streets of the neighborhoods and every once in a while they get out and they bring guitars and they start singing. They're trying to contain the contagion while spread as best they can, whatever manner of calm they can muster up. And I saw somewhere else, I can't even recall the location where they did something similar, but particularly to to give a spark of joy to the children, they broke out in that what seems to now be a universal anthem, or better or worse, Baby Shark. Winking in some form or another to the children, saying to them, you're gonna be okay. We're here to make sure you'll be okay. Perhaps you've seen, as many of us have, images of healthcare workers donning trash bags fixed with duct tape and swim goggles, walking toward the virus as we all huddle to hide from it, to take care of us, sleeping in their own garages so as not to infect their family. I saw a video of a, a, a little boy running to greet his father. His father was a doctor and his father had to help hold out his hands. Imagine what it's like to have to push your child away so you don't make them sick. And then there are these other heroes that may not be doctors or nurses, but keep the hospital rooms clean and sanitized and the garbage taken out. They're not given maybe the same level of fanfare, but they have important roles to play. And the everyday heroes, we see those who are delivering the packages of the supplies we need, those who are working at the checkout counters in stores. The teachers, good Lord, the teachers 
as many of us who are experiencing homeschooling for the first time now recognize on a whole new level the value of teachers. And so we applaud them and cheer them and pray for them and wish them well. And yet there's a risk in getting lost in these heartwarming stories. You see, because every act of heroism, or maybe many of the acts of heroism, are also the sign of systemic failures. Or at the very least, they beg certain questions that at some point or another, we must ask ourselves. Why, in this country of wealth, maybe even of excess, where there is so much, are there not enough beds, not enough gowns, not enough masks, not enough ventilators? When we were warned time and again, this would come. And why is it that when some people get sick, the first question they ask is, do I have the virus? And the second question they ask is, can I afford to go to the doctor? And that's not just some far off people uh, uh, that, that was me, not with respect to the virus, but I remember a couple of years ago, I had what turned out to be uh, just muscle spasms, but they were in my chest and I didn't know what I was feeling. And so I pulled uh, into a parking lot near the hospital, not at the hospital. And I started searching on my phone and I searched for two things. First, the signs of a heart attack or arrhythmia or what that meant. And secondly, the price of a hospital visit. Now I went and thank God everything was okay. And I walked out to a, a bill of over a thousand dollars out of pocket. And I've got insurance and I've got a job. Think of the millions of people who are not nearly as well off as am I. And why? on earth are they wearing trash bags in the first place? Yes, that's heroic. It's also problematic. It's deeply unacceptable. And why are the pay discrepancies in our culture so great in the first place? Yes, there was this wonderful CEO who, of Columbia Sportswear who decreased his salary to $10,000 so he could keep his employees on the payroll. Thanks be to God, and he's not alone in that. But why is the gap so large to begin with? Have you noticed that all the folks that we've now realized are essential workers are often the ones paid the least? We say we value them. We applaud them. We cheer for them. We call them heroes. We could also show them we truly value them by paying them decently, fairly, by showing them materially what we say we believe spiritually. When Jesus began that event that we now call Palm Sunday, he wasn't trying to ride into people's hearts. He was trying to ride into their city, their power center, the power center of their religion and of the way communal life was organized. I know you may not be ready to ask some of those tough questions, but this isn't simply about our own personal piety. That said, if it's all you can do to let Jesus in your heart this time of year, go for it. Let him in. But be forewarned, if you truly let Jesus in to your heart, he'll take up residence. And he won't let you go forever without asking those essential questions about how we order our lives. So my prayer for you, uh, my encouragement for you this day is to let him in. Let them in so that we might be born again, not just as persons, but as a people. Let them in. Let him in that Jesus might not only enter our individual hearts, but the hearts of our cities and our states and our country and our world. Let him in. Let him in that his spirit would reign, not just in our devotional life, but in our public and private and communal and family and neighborly life. Let him in. Let him in so that we might not only be 
burying people right now, but we might be a God bearing people. Let them in. And as you let them in, don't just passively wait inside. Get outside and stand alongside of the street and shout with the saints that went before you, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us now make a few moments of quiet together in prayer. Amen. I have a practice to commend to you to make this real and embodied. We love to wave the palms on Palm Sunday and we couldn't get palms to you safely. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. Wherever you are, after this is over, go outside, take a cutting from a plant or something that's been already dropped from a tree. It could be a palm branch or it could be any branch, any kind of green something or other. And you can weave it into something, you can make it into something, or you can just leave it for the beautiful thing it already is. And I want you to go out and lay it on your curb or in your driveway or just outside your door as a symbol to you, as a reminder to you, just like that robe or that stole. And perhaps a subtle reminder to the world that in your home, the spirit of Christ is invited in. Thanks be to God, my friends. Amen. And now Jeff has a word about the morning offering. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you for your for your words, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, again, the work of the church continues through all of this. Just this past week, uh, our youth and probably some of you helped us as the hot lunch that we normally serve in, at Sausalito Prez right now, uh, they asked us if we could help them with 25 bag lunches and we showed up with 80. And two of our high school leaders, Jeff and Elaine, took the abundance to St. Vincent where they were practically in tears, so grateful that we did this. So the work of the church continues. We And so naturally the needs of the church continues. As much as we pray together, sing together, break bread, share the cup, uh, shelter in place together. We also support the financial needs of our community together. Uh, there are, we can't pass a plate, but there are two different ways that you can give. The easiest of which to find all this is simply going to wpctiburon.org slash give, uh, and you'll see the various options that you have there. One of which is to simply text. We will write the number in the comment box. You should see that there. It is 1415-329-3537. You can simply text give to that number, or again, you can go to wpctiburon.org slash give. And now, would you join me in the doxology? Amen. I hope you all have seen our schedule for Holy Week that is beginning today. Uh, we will have uh, each morning, the next three mornings, a uh, ritual. We are calling it a poured out ritual. It'll be on Facebook at 930, um, but accessible throughout the day. Monday, Thursday, we have three different opportunities to share in communion together. We did email those Zoom links uh, this week. 
but if you need them, simply let me know. And then a worship service on Good Friday, a couple of moments uh, to be together in ritual on Holy Saturday, and then of course, a week from today, Easter Sunday worship. So we do hope you will join us for that. A reminder that you don't need a Facebook account to join us on Facebook. Just look for our page, Westminster Prez Tiburon. In addition, uh, something that's always been special for me during Holy Week is the practice of the Stations of the Cross. And we've put together an at-home Stations of the Cross, is, if that is something that is of interest to you. And you can find that on the homepage of our website, wpctiburon.org. So truly, this is a very special week in the life of the church. It's different this year because we are not together, um, but still a special time. And we hope to see you virtually many times throughout the week. And with that, I invite you to join in our closing hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Well, thank you for journeying with us in this new way this day. Friends, as you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is Father and Mother of us all, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day, be with you every day. Amen.